We now have time for uh, questions. Uh, first question, uh, madam. News agency Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sommer. I have a question regarding meeting with Ukrainian chief of defense. What exactly did you discuss and what is the um, outcome of uh, this discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, indeed, we had a, um, a meeting with a new Ukrainian chief of defense uh, who gave us an overview uh, of events as they have been unfolding. Uh, also gave us an understanding of the, uh, the way the Ukrainian authorities and the Ukrainian armed forces were reacting uh, to the uh, use of military power in Crimea and in other places uh, in vicinity of Ukraine or in Ukraine itself. And uh, we also talked about the upcoming elections here on the 25th and the importance uh, of those elections in the democratic process uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we also had the opportunity to review our military-to-military -military cooperation and to see how we could extend it uh, within the, uh, the agreement which exists between Ukraine and the alliance. Uh, and we are ready to reconvene with our Ukrainian colleague uh, when necessary to address whatever uh, issues will pop up in the future. Question right there. Uh, yes, Adrian Croft uh, from Reuters. I had a question for General Breedlove, please, if possible. After what the um, Secretary General said today, uh, that some Russian troops may be withdrawing from the Ukraine border, could you tell us what your assessment is, please, of what the Russian military is doing? How many Russian troops you estimate are still in the vicinity of the Ukraine border and what their intentions are now? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, for several days now, uh, there has been claims that the troops are departing the border, and for several days we saw no evidence of movement at all. We are now seeing some movement of troops. It is far too early to classify the size or what is the effect of the troops. It is interesting that we note that most of the movement is in uh, one particular era, area, and there remains uh, a large formation uh, a very capable formation in several concerning avenues of approach. So what we, uh, to put it very sharply, we have seen some movement. It's too early to know where they're moving to or how many of them are moving. But what we do know is that the force that remains on the border is very large and it's very capable and remains in a very coercive posture. Thank you. Next question uh, over there, please. Okay, uh, I want to move for another issue. My name is Wasim Ibrahim from uh, Asafir uh, newspaper, Lebanese newspaper. Uh, you mentioned Syria, and I want to ask you a specific question as professionals, because the politicians all the time they are speaking about Syria, especially in Europe, as especially the uh, foreign fighters as a main threat to Europe. So we didn't hear that much as you are uh, a security organization. So. Uh, what's your real assessment at the first place? And the second place, uh, what are you doing in this contest? Uh, do you think that the politicians, they are kidding with us when they are talking about a real threat or not? Thank you. First of all, the, uh, the civil war unfolding now over a number of years in Syria is foremost a tragedy for Syria and its population. Uh, secondly, there is no doubt that the events in Syria have a substantial destabilizing effect uh, on the whole region of the Middle East, uh, particularly as a number of neighbors are becoming fragilized by events in Syria. Let me just highlight uh, Iraq, Jordan and Lebanon who, fa who share borders uh, with Syria uh, and of course then are indirectly involved uh, in having to guard uh, their borders, uh, make sure that the threat does not expand, etc. Uh, the whole region is thus influenced by the events uh, in Syria and it has substantial repercussions in general. Uh, we did not touch upon uh, some of the details of the issues which you have just mentioned, but Syria is a very serious concern for all because it is in nobody's interest in having the Middle East destabilized by that conflict. So why you are not talking about this as a, secu a main security 
a threat while the European politicians, they are talking about this issue all the time. So are they kidding or uh, exaggerating or not? What's your assessment? Sorry. I fail to see the disagreement in what you are expressing and what I said. We do consider Syria, a Syria, the Syria issue to be a very serious issue which has repercussion for the alliance security. And that's why we highlighted it. Next so uh, we are not, as far as I know, nobody is kidding anybody. Next question. Yes. Uh, Brooks Tigner, Jane's Defense. I have two questions for all three of you, and you can take it. First, um, how will the NATO response force fit into NATO's, as you see it, NATO's strategic adaptation to this changed security environment and Russia's tactics? And do you envision it to be used beyond training and interoperability in this new environment? Secondly, are you encouraging the national chads to further develop their special forces for this changed security environment? Thank you. Let me just start by, by a chapeau on, on this issue. Um, we, uh, in the light of uh, unfolding events in Ukraine, we have considered, of course, all possible uh, venues uh, to make sure that we adapt accordingly. And indeed, the NIF is one of those issues which has uh, been discussed, and also the use of special operation forces as such. But I will let uh, Sakur touch upon those operational matters. So certainly the NRF is a, a part of our considerations as to what we do next. We have to now look at this practice that Russia has of amassing large forces on borders in the name of exercises. Sometimes they exercise, sometimes they go across a sovereign border, as you heard me describe earlier. And how do we adapt to that? Uh, we talked, uh, and I believe that in NATO we have all the right tools we may just need to adapt those tools. Right now, the NRF does a superb job of doing exactly what we ask it to do. Are we asking it to do the right things in face of the new threats? That is part of the discussion that I believe we need to have. And this relates primarily to the responsiveness of those forces. Right now, my organization uh, and John Paul's organization trains, exercises, and I evaluate the NRF to meet its stated goals and objectives, and it does a magnificent job. But the question is, are we asking it to do the right things? Is it responsive enough to meet the new threat? And that's what we'll be discussing over the next weeks. All right, next question, front row. The uh, Secretary General on Monday said that he expected that we'd now see Russian pressure uh, brought to bear against Moldova and Georgia as the deadline for a signature with agreement of agreement with the European Union approaches. Have you gentlemen observed anything on the military uh, in the military realm in that in that area? Thank you. Generally speaking, and then I will hand over to uh, to Sakur. Generally speaking, we are well aware of that dimension, the possibility of that dimension, and indeed this has been addressed also during our discussions as to details of it, uh, Phil. So, um, uh, obviously, we will not go into classified details here, but what you have seen in your own press is that some of the narrative that first played out in Crimea and then the narrative that started playing out in eastern Ukraine, some of that now is playing out in Transnistria and Moldova. So this is concerning, and we need to keep our eye on it. I think it's too early to say that anything definitive is happening, but some of the circumstances that we saw play out in these two most recent issues, uh, we now see playing out to some degree in Transnistria. Thank you. Madam? Terry Schultz with the National Public Radio and CBS News. Um, General Breedlove, um, or anyone else who'd care to take this question, um, what would constitute a meaningful pullback of Russian forces? I mean, you say you see some movement. How many would have to move, and, and how far back would they have to pull into Russia for you to consider that <clears throat> a meaningful pullback? And how many would it take before it, it, it you would deem the situation safe again, and would that, would that affect your future planning? Because now that you know they can do this, uh, and nothing's ever the same again. I'm happy to take that, and my, my answer may sound glib, but it's not. 100% pullback would be the right answer. These forces were brought to the border uh, in the name of an exercise. 
they should return to their pre-exercise stationing areas. As long as they remain in the uh, area of the border or nearby the border, they remain a coercive force. And I don't think that that is uh, the appropriate answer for a long-term position of the troops. I would just like to reinforce exactly what uh, General Briglove has said. It's 100% is back to their garrisons where they belong and not along the borders of Ukraine. Right, we have a question over there. In the back. Jako dospěvaček News Agency, do gentlemen envisage any uh, worsening of situation with ISAF because of the worse, because of the bad the relations with Russia? I mean, overflights uh, and this kind of thing. Thank you. I do not uh, see any reason why the, uh, there should be any negative impact uh, on our conduct of operations in Afghanistan. Uh, um, in as much as the uh, operations, the ongoing operations are uh, unfolding in a quite satisfactory way uh, and the plans for the future are in place pending decisions to be made politically. Uh, but as to the details, I will refer to, to Sakur. So some detailed answers. Uh, no. The uh, return routes that we use, which involve Russia, we've seen no change in. Um, and there are areas in ISAF where it is very much in Russia's interest to cooperate with us. As you know, the poppy crop and the flow of drugs out of Afghanistan affects Russia far more than the NATO nations. And so there are places where it is to our mutual benefit, theirs and ours, to continue to cooperate. So the short answer is I see no worsening of the situation in ISAF right now. As, a, as it relates to the current situation in Ukraine. Right, next question, over there. Uh, uh, Jim Duker from, from Bloomberg. If I could just follow up the question of the uh, Russian uh, purported withdrawal. Uh, are you still uh, working with the number of 40,000 Russian troops massed in forward positions near the border, or uh, are you able already to reduce that estimate? And um, what uh, sort of emplacements or hardware uh, have these uh, initially withdrawn troops left behind? In other words, how quickly could uh, they move back into uh, an aggressive stance on the border? Again, um, I, the answer hasn't changed much from before. I don't mean to be glib again, but uh, we have seen movement. It is, I think, too early to classify the size and nature of it. We have seen some loading of mechanized vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. We have seen some uh, 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 containment areas that uh, are not, there is no leave behind. So uh, it's just too early to know. But the scope of the movement that we have seen so far is, uh, is not going to affect the capability of the very large force that's there now. When we do get better indications of the actual sizes of the movements, I think we will uh, be able to report better to you. And remember that they have been claiming that there's movements for three days. We have finally now just begun to see a little. So it's just too early to, clap, to sort of be clear about what those numbers are. We have time for two more questions. Next question. Bonjour, Yann Cordis, Agence Europe. J'ai une question pour le général Paolo Meros. Uh, C'est un peu une question de suivi par rapport à mon collègue uh, Brooks. Uh, uh, vous avez tous parlé de l'adaptation nécessaire en vue de, de, de l'environnement sécuritaire qui a changé en Europe. Est-ce que vous pourriez préciser comment le programme de formation et d'entraînement va être modifié dans les prochaines années, puisque c'est un programme sur lequel vous travaillez depuis longtemps, uh, mais que le contexte a, a changé Est-ce que la nature des exercices va changer, leur forme, leur emplacement géographique Merci. En fait, le programme, je vous répondrai en français, le programme de, d de connexion des forces, l'initiative de connexion des forces, euh, lancé il y a maintenant deux ans, euh, que nous avons développé, qui est aujourd'hui un, un programme complet et qui est déjà d'ailleurs mis en œuvre. La, la première manifestation, c'était l'exercice Steadfast Jazz, je le rappelle, qui était un exercice de défense collective en Pologne il n'y a pas si longtemps, à la fin de l'année 2013. Cette année, nous avons encore un certain nombre d'exercices. Vous avez peut-être suivi le dernier exercice euh, entre, avec la, la, la force navale de l'OTAN 
et la, le corps de réaction rapide espagnol qui contribue à la NRF. Donc c'est un exercice d'abord qui est très dynamique, qui intègre toutes les composantes nationales, multinationales et otaniennes, et qui euh, vise à répondre aux besoins d'entraînement, de disponibilité des forces euh, en permanence et, et améliorer leur interopérabilité. Ce faisant, évidemment, ce programme, il faut qu'on puisse s'adapter aux besoins, et c'est exactement ce que nous sommes en train de faire, selon les besoins exprimés par, par Philippe, par Secure, et nous avons fait des propositions, mais qui ne changent pas la nature même du programme de, de formation, puisqu'il est là et il est très complet, mais qui simplement réajuste et demande des contributions, je dirais, nationales supplémentaires, qui amplifient aussi des exercices qui existent déjà. On a eu l'exemple de l'exercice en Estonie, qui a été redirigé et qui a été transféré sous la responsabilité de l'OTAN. C'est ça aussi la dynamique de l'initiative des forces connectées, qui est vraiment une initiative très porteuse pour améliorer l'efficacité, la disponibilité et l'interopérabilité des forces de l'OTAN. Thank you. And the final question Right. Madam? Again, Ms. Agency, Interfax, Ukraine. I would like to repeat the question of my colleague, because if earlier we heard that after Russian troops will receive an order to move to cross a border with Ukraine, it will take 48 hours. What it will take now, when they will have this order to withdraw? How many hours? Nothing has changed. As I said before, we've only seen a small movement of forces. The force that remains behind on the Ukrainian border right now is able to do exactly what it could do a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, so nothing has changed. Right. That uh, concludes the uh, press conference. Thank you for coming. The video and transcripts will be available at the uh, IMS website via the front page of NATO uh, in a short while. Thank you.